We are not pencils. We are witnessing firsthand the dangers of relying on complex, uncontrolled global supply chains. Oh, man. From the American conservative, uh, just Dateline the other day, but Declan Leary. Um, Leary. We're going to read this a little bit because this, I've been thinking about this a lot. Many of y'all know that I love, I Pencil from Leonard Reed is just one of the all-time most classic libertarian uh, small stories. I don't even call it a story. Just, it's insanely good. This was written like 1948 or something like that. It's just, it's it's fundamental to libertarianism. Let's put it this way. Um, it's just, it's amazing. So let's read you a little bit of this. And uh, ideas are most powerful when they're wrapped in a compelling story. Leonard's made point. Economies can be hardly planned when not one soul possesses all the know-how and skills to produce a simple pencil. Unfolds in the enchanting words of a pencil itself. He could have written I car or I airplane, but choosing those more complex items would have muted, muted the message. No one person, repeat, no one, no matter how smart or how many degrees they have, could create from a search a small everyday pencil, from scratch, a small everyday pencil let alone a car or an airplane. It's a message that humbles the high and mighty. It pricks the inflated egos of those who think they know how to mind everyone else's business. Yep, exactly. Uh, Robespierre is said to have blessed the horrific French Revolution with his chilling declaration uh, that no one, can, no, no one can't expect to make an omelet without the breaking of eggs. Well, they broke tons of eggs by the thousands in a vain effort to impose a utopian society upon France. But none of the Robespierre's of the world know how to make a pencil, yet they want to make re remake entire societies. How utterly preposterous and mournfully tragic. But we will miss a large implication of Leonard Reed's message if we assume it only aims at the tyrants whose names we all know. The lesson of I pencil is not that the error begins when the planners plan big. It begins the moment one tosses humility aside, assumes he knows the unknowable and employs the force of the state against peaceful individuals. That's not just a national disease. It can be very local indeed, as we're witnessing now. Yep. In our midst, our people think that if only they had the government power on their side, they could pick tomorrow's winners and losers in the marketplace, set prices or rents where they ought to be, decide what forms of energy art we should power our homes, and choose which industries should survive and which should die. They should stop for a few moments and learn a little bit of humility from a lowly writing implement. All right, so we're going to stop there for a second because I want to show you what... We just got to read this because it's it's just it's fundamentally found ta fantastic. But I've been thinking a lot about this because it has everything to do with supply chains. I'm telling you, it's, it's, I want to just go over one thing real quick and then we'll kind of come back around. Let's go to mail. One of the best things I've loved about this article is once government has a monopoly of a creative activity such as the delivery of mails, most individuals believe that the mails could not be efficiently delivered by men acting freely. And here's the reason. Each one acknowledges that he himself doesn't know how to do all the things incident to mail delivery. He also recognizes that no other individual, individual could do it. These assumptions are correct. No individual possesses enough know-how to perform a nation's mail delivery any more than an individual possesses enough know-how on how to make a pencil. Now, in the absence of faith in free people, and the unawareness that millions of tiny know-hows would naturally and miraculously form and cooperate to satisfy this necessity. The individual cannot help but reach the erroneous, erroneous conclusion that the mail delivered can only be by government masterminding. All right, one hundred percent. So then we come to where we are today: reliance on complex, uncontrolled, globalized supply chains. And we talk about it. in December uh, nineteen fifty-eight. Leonard Reed published a blockbuster essay in The Freeman, which had a few years prior been acquired as a for-profit project by his Foundation for Economic Education. In I Pencil, he outlined the staggering complexity of the globe-spanning market network by which an object seemingly so simple as a pencil is brought into being. Countless laborers have been involved in the production of the wood component by the time it reaches the pencil factory, all the way to the lumberjack who chopped down the tree, uh, and of course, we must consider the factory workers who assembled the truck, the lumberjack who drove to the, the, the who assembled the truck, the lumberjack drove the forest that day, the craftsman who forged the axe he swung to fell the tree, the South American peasants who picked the beans for the coffee he brewed. The capacities of individual market actors naturally 
yes, automatically arrange themselves into creative and productive patterns in response to human necessity and demand without ever realizing it. The Brazilian bean picker plays an integral role in the rival of a yellow number two pencil on the American writer's desk. Had he not done so, each of them be the worse off for it. He concludes his pain is a uh, pain, pine, whatever to the pencil. The lesson I have to teach is this, leave all creative energies uninhibited, merely organize society to act in harmony with this lesson. Let society's legal apparatus remove all obstacles the best it can. Permit these creative know-hows freely to flow. Have faith that free men and women will respond to the invisible hand. The faith will be confirmed. Ugh. I pencil treat supply chains as a language of religion. There are, they are miracles in which we must have faith. They are a product of some inscrutable but benevolent superhuman intelligence. The precision alone of the invisible hand demands from us reverence and wonder. And yet, such far-reaching complexity is not without its pitfalls. Reed himself effectively admits as much, albeit accidentally, when he writes that neither the miner nor the logger can be dispensed with any more than can the chemist at the factory or the work in the oil field. This, this is meant not only to reinforce our awe, but to, to the discerning reader, especially now, it is in fact an admission of the supposed miracle's profound fragility. It neither is the miner nor the logger can be dispensed with. What happens if the miner or the logger stops showing up for work? What happens if half the truck drivers suddenly decide to stop driving in a quick succession? It looks like we're about to find out. Right now, all across America and elsewhere in the world, shelves that would have been stocked two years ago stand empty for days to end. All major ports along the coast, massive and mounting quantities of cargo are backed up, waiting for distribution networks to naturally, yes, automatically sort themselves out. The same great chains that just yesterday brought us cheap clothes and biohazards from our neighbors across the ocean by now are sitting frozen and fractured at worst. Frozen at best and fractured at worst. We find ourselves here on the brink of a crisis, not only thanks to some invisible hand, but thanks to a series of active choices. In important ways, America chose to take Leonard Reed's advice, leave all creative energies uninhibited, merely organize society to act in harmony. The most significant development in American political economy since Reed's writing more than six decades ago has been the removal of nearly every obstacle to such organization at the international level. The invisible hand wrenched away not just American jobs, but Americans' very capacity to produce things. This is the darker side of the miracle. Trade-offs not just of one good or service for another, but the ability to do something ourselves for the luxury of not having to. Nor is this problem unique to deindustrialization and the ascendance of Red China. It can just be easily as tied to industrialization. Reliance on machines has become the norm. The human capacity for self-reliance and the social and economic primacy of craft virtually disappeared. In return for their abandonment, we got vastly increased capacities for innovation and creation. Configuring naturally and spontaneously in response to human necessity and desire for the absence of any human masterminding. And yet, when it works, it's, it's a miracle. We don't just get pencils. We get out-of-season fruits, foreign crops, iPhones, cars, electric power, all things that we could not have produced by ourselves. But when it doesn't work, we sign our, find ourselves thoroughly screwed. Forget about pencils. We can't even get meat. If we're lucky, we'll have all non-perishable stocked up to tide us over until the next delayed shipments arrive. We certainly can produ cannot produce for ourselves because we have placed so much faith in the perfect function of a spontaneous arrangements of millions of individuals acting independently. In these moments, we see clearly how tenuous our position is, how fully we've subjected ourselves and our communities to the mercies of the invisible hand. Think long and hard about the nature of human intelligence whose end, is, end result is a fracture of human society and the eradication of human powers. What do we do with what that realization? We can uh, Pete Buttigieg our way through it and insist it's all some kind of creative destruction. Hold on a second, my wife is... He says things, uh, Buttigieg, Buttigieg says things are just going badly because they're so going so well. This is a libertarian mindset. Sure, we may be entirely incapable of fending for ourselves independent of mammon and leviathan. Our entire world may be upturned in an instant by any one of these superhuman energies unleash their, their faith and freedom. We, not actually, we may not actually own any substantial property, including the land our families live on nor have any useful skills that are not contingent on the miracle of survival. 
But you can pick up your iPhone and push five buttons and have Tasty Hot Pizza delivered to you within 30 minutes. Or we can reject the miracles fully as we're able, withdraw from dependence on a global system, reconnect ourselves to local, tangible human networks of production and consumption. Accept humbly that subject, subject, subjectation to forces we cannot control may not necessarily be a reasonable price for the creation of products we could not have made. Now, you don't have to go live in a cabin in the Montana, but you can take small steps to wean yourself off our fragile global supply chains and into the anti-fragile -anti ones. Grow as much food as you can. Learn as many back pocket skills as you can manage. Join co-ops for meat and vegetables with local gardeners and farmers. Shop at farmers markets with local craftsmen. It's worth noting, in light of these particular suggestions, that independence from the system is not antisocial at all. If you're in a position to do so, maybe even encourage the production of complex goods at sustainable levels with regulations and incentives to buy in country. There will always be a risk in the world. Famine or a meteorite could strike your land tomorrow, but it's always wise to reduce your vulnerability to chance at the lowest level possible. Maybe you have to do without your pencil. The long, winding, miraculous supply chain isn't likely to get you that either, or anything else for that matter. <sighs> If the miner is indispensable, some comments. If the miner is indispensable, that doesn't mean everyone should drop what they're doing and grab a pickaxe, but it might mean ensuring miners uh, adequate pay, good working conditions, basically all those things that the far right derives as socialism. Okay, as socialism because socialism does all those things, right? Good healthcare coverage, good working conditions, adequate pay. Ah, freaking idiot. Let's see what else we got. Um, that's just stupid. Uh, right. Let's see what this, who's this guy? All right. Uh, for decades, supporters of the neoliberal logic defended ever increasing C-suite compensation package with the adages, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys while keeping wages for labor low and long. Uh, all right. So the American conservative gets a lot of far lefties on here. It's weird, man. It would be enough for me if the government just stopped spending and printing. It's all about money printing. The issue uh, is capitalism. As an owner of capital searching for return of capital, your director of capital where it has the highest returns. Uh, all right, I, I don't, this, the comments bore me on this, uh, but I hope you're having a reawakening of the libertarian fantasy here of, I tell you, because um, this is, I, look, I've fallen for it. I still do. I don't mow my lawn anymore. I, I hire out because my time's more valuable doing this, believe it or not, it's crazy. But what if you're not building large power transmissions, LPTs, because your time is more valuable moving hedge fund money around from point A to point B. And I'm saying as a country, instead of relying on your mortal enemies to do that for you, and then all of a sudden the supply chain goes down, your mortal enemy says, we're not going to give you these LPTs. What do you do then? I've been talking about this since I started this YouTube channel, by the way. I've been talking about this, supply chain issues, LPTs, large power transmissions, the lack of steel. And here we are. And I just think it's going to get worse. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But this is not sustainable. It's just not, man. Yeah. Anyone know about... I'll do another video on that. All right, we'll see you.